In the beginning, there was nothing. Not even a single thing. Not even nothingness. In the single moment of the instantaneous creation of all things, nothingness became aware that it was non-existent. The moment it became aware that it was non-existent, all things came into existence. Welcome to the Real Spiritual Gangster Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Wenzel, and today I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, who I am personally and why I'm passionate about spirituality and gang politics and politics in general. Um, uh, I've been very reluctant to tell this story. It's taken me a very long time to come to a place where I feel that I'm ready to tell the story. And um, I'd like to preface this story with just saying that the only reason I'm willing to tell this story and put myself out there a little bit is I would really like to bring uh, very influential people in the area of, um, you know, maybe like street culture, hip hop culture, gang culture, as well as uh, politics in general and... um, Spirituality. So I, I, everything from s- spiritual uh, ideas and concepts to street politics is basically the range of things that I'll be covering um, on this podcast. And I just sort of feel that, you know, everyone out there kind of has a right to know, like, who is this person? Why am I even listening to them? Um, why is this relevant? So I'll just dive right in. Um, I'm currently 39 years old. I was born in 1978 uh, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And apparently I was born into essentially one of the largest busts of organized crime in U.S. history. Um, If any of you have ever seen the movie Casino, the movie Casino is the true life story about something that I was born into. Um... My father was an attorney at the time, and he was working um, with a law firm, and one of his best friends was John Balistrieri. John Balistrieri is known for being the head of the Milwaukee Mafia, um, probably to this day. And at the time, uh, in I believe it was, I'm I'm not sure the exact year or dates, but I believe it was the very early 80s, maybe even 1980, shortly after I was born, um, basically the mob bosses of a lot of Midwest cities, I believe it was something like Milwaukee, Chicago, Kansas City, um, maybe Cleveland was in there. It was essentially the mob bosses of several Midwest cities um, were all rounded up and indicted uh, and charged with a bunch of crimes relating to skimming money from a casino in Las Vegas. Um and you know, and they you know eventually made uh, the movie Casino about that exact story. So let me um, let me just bring some clarity to that story real quick, just to kind of recap it for people that aren't familiar with it, or you know, the movie came out quite a while ago, so I doubt many people have this story fresh on their mind. Um, Essentially what happens in the real life version of this story is a San Diego businessman is looking for money to open a casino. He's shopping around looking for, uh, you know, some, I don't know, 60 to $70 million, somewhere in that range. But this was in the seventies, um, to build a casino. And everyone keeps telling him, Hey, you got to go see this guy, Frank Balistrieri. He's, uh, the head of this Teamsters union and they have a lot of money and they can, they can find the money for you. And, and fund your casino. Turns out that Frank Balistrieri was, um, he was not only the head of a Teamsters union that was able to uh, come up with the funds and, and loan uh, the San Diego businessman the money to open a casino, but he also happened to be the head of the Milwaukee Mafia. Um, and that is, uh, you know, when I say the Mafia, it's you know, like exactly what it sounds like, like what you see in the movie Soprano or in the TV show Sopranos, what was in the movie Goodfellas, um, the Italian Mafia. And Frank Balistrieri, um, 
was sort of the boss of bosses, uh, at least in this deal and this operation. And there's all kinds of speculation that essentially in that area, um, my understanding is that essentially Chicago sort of typically ran that area, um, you know, between the Midwest, all the Midwest cities, it was usually Chicago was kind of where the headquarters was. However, there was a lot of heat on Chicago. So, uh, from sources, uh, I have over the years, I've just heard that, you know, that they actually covertly actually ran things out of Milwaukee because it was more low key because everyone was watching Chicago. So I don't know if all this is true. I don't know. A lot of these details are true. Um, all the research I've ever done seems to point this way. Even the movie Casino portrays Frank Balistrieri this way. So I'm personally under the impression that um, Frank Balistrieri was sort of the boss of bosses among all the Midwest bosses. So anyway, to bring this full circle, um, I didn't really know what all this was at the time. Obviously, I was a, a baby. I didn't know anything. Um, but my in the midst of this chaos, so basically, uh, once the FBI, uh, in the movie Casino, the FBI gets turned on to the operation, I believe, because some guy in a deli in New York was uh, talking and the, there was a wiretap in the deli and they picked up on a conversation and they heard that there was some kind of money skimming operation going on out in Vegas. So then they started watching uh, the casino and the people involved in it and they eventually were able to monitor and watch um, what these guys were doing and they were just basically filling duffel bags full of money and shipping it back to the Midwest and dividing it up <clears throat> among all these mob bosses that had their money in on the casino. Um, so when I was 17 years old, though, um, here's where the story starts to get a little crazy and intense and that you'll quickly see why it's taken me a long time to uh, tell this story and um, put myself out there and engage the world uh, as I actually am. So when I was 17 years old, I um, had an assignment in school where my I was in a sociology class and I was basically told, uh, they kind of divided up the class, who here is um, Jewish, who's Catholic, who's Hindu, who's, you know, what is everybody's backgrounds? And I didn't really know anything or have a reference point for anything. So <clears throat> I knew that I had been baptized Catholic, so when they, uh, you know, asked which category I was in, I just decided to go with the Catholic because I thought I was probably baptized Catholic when I was a child, so that probably made the most sense, even though I didn't really identify with it or ever practice. Um, so they, he gave a, our teacher gave a different assignment to everybody, in, to the different groups in the class. So to the people who identified as Catholic, the assignment was to go home and find out who your godparents were. It was just basically an, an exercise in, in like your culture. So um, apparently, I, I guess Catholics have godparents or something like that. So anyway, I went home and I, <clears throat> it was right around my 17th birthday. Um, I was living in Wisconsin with my dad at the time. I'm actually f mostly grew up in Arizona, but at that point in my childhood, I just happened to be living with my dad. And I asked my dad, who is my godparents? And he said, well, that's a really interesting question. Um, maybe on your birthday, I'll take you downtown. He lived outside Milwaukee, uh, you know, maybe 30 minutes outside Milwaukee in the country on a lake. And <clears throat> he basically said, you know, maybe on your birthday, I'll take you into Milwaukee and I'll, I'll uh, try to have you meet your godfather and I'll tell you a little bit about your your background. So I was, um, my birthday came and he took me into town and took me to a German restaurant in downtown Milwaukee and started to tell me a story about how my grandfather, uh, he was basically half German, half Italian and started to tell me about our German heritage and our German background. Um, you know, tried to instill in me the positive aspects of German culture, you know, engineering abilities and um, 
you know, just very uh, advanced in sort of left brain uh, thinking, mathematics and engineering and things like that. And then, um, and then he said, okay, now I'm going to tell you about the Italian side of your family. And basically said, uh, your godfather is John Balistrieri, and John Balistrieri is the head of the mafia. So, <clears throat> as you can imagine, um, that was quite a lot uh, to take in for a 17-year-old male. Um, and I think I was just the right personality type. I had sort of had a rough childhood, and my parents split up uh, sometime when I was really young. I'm not even sure how old I was, maybe three or four or something like that. And, um, so I, I, you know, I lived between Wisconsin and Arizona and I bounced around a lot and a lot of times when parents weren't present and, um, got into all kinds of crazy stuff. But <clears throat> long story short, um, I'd already had sort of an intense childhood and had gravitated towards, uh, was starting to gravitate towards gravitate towards gang culture at that time in my adolescence. And, um, I'd already actually been through a lot and kind of, uh, exposed myself to a lot of, um, intense, uh, gang politics and street culture kind of stuff. And so hearing this, uh, piece of information, it definitely shifted my mindset, um, kind of just, I guess, blew my mind. And, and I was really searching for meaning in my life and, you know, who am I and why am I here and what am I doing in this world, in this life? What is my purpose? <clears throat> you know, these are all the things I think I was struggling with in my adolescence. And um, I, I, the interesting thing is I'd already, like I said, gone uh, in this path uh, to a certain extent. So finding out this information kind of just took me to a whole nother level of understanding of like, whoa, okay, I, maybe I meant for this. So, um, anyway, I came back to, was, uh, Arizona. I was, I was forced to live with my father for about a year in high school against my will. Um, and I had been sort of like semi gang affiliated and <clears throat> kind of just, I don't really know how to explain it. I, I went to high school from 1992 to 1996. So those of you who grew up in the same era, the same time frame, probably remember that gang culture and hip-hop culture was really starting to explode and take off. And <clears throat> I had kind of um, been exposed to a, a, just a lot of that stuff. I mean, I'm a, a white kid who is living in northern Arizona, two hours from Phoenix, uh, in a small town. Um, and you know, should have been, uh, relatively removed from all this kind of stuff, but you know, to the contrary, we weren't, we were just as affected as most other places in the country. And I basically had, um, a lot of, we had a lot of conflict and problems with people. We're getting in a lot of fights. Um, and a lot of these people were gang affiliated. So there was a time in high school where basically, um, this is where I'm, I have to start becoming discerning about how much can I say and how much should I not say. But <clears throat> long story short is I was basically gang banging and I was right at a tipping point, right? I wasn't full blown gang. Like I wasn't initiated into a gang or anything like that, but I'd been exposed to gang culture. I was going to high school where <clears throat> what I believe to be basically a lot of fake, uh, wannabe gangsters. Um, there was basically in, I preface this with, uh, you know, I have no racial, um, hatred towards, you know, any, any other race. And as you're going to hear, as I keep telling my story, you're going to see that I, I basically has been, I'm, I'm white. Uh, I live in Arizona. If I go to jail or prison, I'm basically under the jurisdiction of Aryan Brotherhood and you're forced to be 
uh, only associate you know, or politically associate yourself with your own race. I mean, you, you have to stay within the boundaries of your own race and follow the rules of your race. So, um, but I basically was you know, more than almost any white person I knew hung out with more blacks and Mexicans than probably any other white person I grew up with. So, <clears throat> and, um, I'm not even sure how to get into this. I mean, I, I guess that I'm about to cross the, the tipping point where the story starts to get really intense. So if I backtrack now, so this, uh, so what I've, all I've really told you so far is that I was told my godfather was the head of the mafia essentially. And I was born into the true story of the movie Casino. At 17 years old is when I became aware of all of this, which is around the time that I was really getting gang affiliated and, and getting involved in this kind of stuff. But if I back up, there was a time period when I was about eight years old. I'd gone back and forth to my mom and dad, and there was a time when I was eight, maybe like maybe even seven, seven, eight, nine, somewhere in that area, <clears throat> where I had to go back and live with my dad in Wisconsin. And he was... Um, basically doing a lot of cocaine and he he had a law license and should have been practicing law but basically you know he was hanging out with um you know mob connected people and um a bunch of people who are up to no good to say as much as i can without <laughs> saying anything and uh he was really he got really into doing a lot of cocaine uh, became very unpresent, and there was this long bouts of me kind of having to fend for myself, and we kind of lived in somewhat of a ghetto area at the time. It's not really that ghetto today, but in 1985, 1986, it was a little more run down, this particular section in Milwaukee. And although it was still uh, mostly a bunch of white kids in the neighborhood, and all of them were a lot older than me, or not a lot older, but I was eight, and they were most of the kids in the neighborhood were about 12 years old. 12, 13, 11, and I was like eight. So I was a lot younger than most of the kids. And <clears throat> at that time, I was just a kind of a wild kid fending for myself. I would, I literally spent multiple nights uh, with no parents at all, just me by myself, eight years old, fending for myself, buying my own food, taking care of myself, nobody around, nobody taking care of me. Um, so I was a little... Uh, Intense. I, I mean, there, I remember a couple moments where I beat up some older kids, uh, some of these twelve-year-olds. I tried to fight some of them. Uh, I don't even remember what caused it, but you know, I went to their house and tried to get them to come outside, and they wouldn't. So I started kicking their fence down. They had a wood fence outside, and I was yelling for this kid to come downstairs and fight me. And I <clears throat> kept cook, kicking these wood beams in their fence down, just knocking their fence down one by one screaming for this kid to come out and fight me, but he wouldn't. And um, in any case, I, I had this little moment in my early, early childhood, seven, eight, nine years old, where I was just living a really crazy ghetto life. I would, you know, go in my dad's room. after He would be gone for days, and then he'd come home, and he'd sleep forever. <clears throat> and I'd go in his room and snoop around and find little vials of cocaine and find $100 bill, stacks of money, $100 bills, and I would steal the money from him. And then I'd use the money to survive when he wasn't home. So that's kind of how I survived. <clears throat> and um, I had this period of my life at that age where I was just living this very ghetto life. And then all of a sudden my mom, um, she had been gone. She actually had been out of the country. She was living in Belize, Central America, where she actually had my younger brother with another man, with, a, with his father. And um, she came back to the United States after being gone for a year or two or something like that. And um, they came to be with us and try to get custody of us. So <clears throat> um, me and my newborn baby brother, who's eight years younger than me, and my sister and my mom and my um, brother's dad all lived in, in, a, in a nice, slightly nicer neighborhood in, in Milwaukee uh, for about a year when I was nine. And then I, after that, <clears throat> we, he, he ended up being an alcoholic. Uh, me and my sister and my brother and my mom fled in the middle of the night and came to Sedona, Arizona, where her mother lived, who was the minister of the Unity Church here in Sedona. So 
This uh, juncture in the story is sort of where you can see um, I go from kind of only being exposed to uh, chaos and dysfunction and, uh, you know, a ghetto life. And um, I mean, I guess just dysfunction. And to all of a sudden um, being in like, you know, sort of a spiritual epicenter of the world uh, with a grandmother who's actually a spiritual teacher. Um, so this this uh, gap from literally being born into the largest uh, bust of organized crime in U.S. history with my godfather actually being the head of the mafia uh, that was involved in that bust that the movie Casino is about to my grandmother um, teaching me spiritual teachings in Sedona, Arizona and providing this, you know, super safe, um, healing, open-minded, uh, light energy. <clears throat> Very uh, heavenly is how I would probably phrase it. I got to see this polarity and it gave me a lot of insight into the world and I always seem to understand and know things in one world, you know, when I'm in that world and I'm in a spiritual world, I'm around a bunch of people who very often have not seen the kind of street life that I've seen <clears throat> and vice versa. When I'm, when I'm in the hood or I'm living in like a street life culture, a lot of those people haven't been exposed to sort of the spiritual community, um, environment that I've, I've been exposed to. So that is, is sort of a, uh, I think you're already starting to see a beginning of like why this podcast is called the real spiritual gangster podcast, because my life to me has at least been truly spanned, uh, the most extreme on both ends of that spectrum. And I've just really never met too many people like me, although I do believe there's probably a lot of people like me out there. Um, I just personally haven't met a lot of them and I think I will probably meet more of them as I put myself out there. I'm sure people that will ident can identify with my story may reach out to me or I may just, through serendipity, just start to meet these people because I'm putting that energy out there. So um, I think what I'd like to do now, uh, that, that just kind of gives like a very, it's pretty vague uh, overview, but from this point forward, I'm about 22 minutes into this uh, episode. I want to, I want to speak I want to shift. Uh, right, I want to shift to speaking to people who actually come from this culture. So, for all of you out there who actually are um, gangsters, I mean, if you gangbang, hustle, if you uh, have been involved in organized crime, I mean, I don't, I don't care what level, I don't care where you're at. If you're just a part of that world, the, I mean, some people call it the underworld or street culture. I don't know, whatever you want to call it. Um, I'm basically just going to kind of lay out my history with gangs and gang politics and just create sort of an arc that you can sort of uh, sink your teeth into something so that you can just kind of get who I am and how I got to where I am and what my, you know, what, what I'm made of, what I've been through. <clears throat> so I was born into the largest bust of organized crime in U.S. history. I was told that my um, godfather was the head of the mafia. Now, that neighborhood that all that stuff happened in when I was eight years old in Milwaukee that I was just talking about a couple minutes ago, that, when I came back to that neighborhood when I was uh, in junior high, I was 12, 13, somewhere in that age. <clears throat> I came back after all those years gone by, five years gone by or something like that. And that neighborhood, a lot of those people had basically become gang-affiliated with Gangster's Disciples, a gang out of Chicago. It's actually a black gang out of Chicago founded by Larry Hoover, and um, who's actually also the, the person who a lot of people probably heard of this term, the G-Code. And Larry Hoover's actually the person who literally created the actual G code, which is the code that gangster disciples follow. So when I was about 12, 13 years old, I went back to this neighborhood. And granted, 
all these kids I hung out with and knew, and these even the kids I beat up and kids I tried to fight, they were all white kids, but they were kind of the hood white, hood white kids that in the early 90s started to identify with Gangster's Disciples, and I'm not even sure how many of them actually got jumped in, sworn in. I just know that they were they were gangbanging. They were wearing GD, uh, you know, wearing blue and black and, you know, fighting and getting involved in all kinds of gangster shit, basically. And I came back to that neighborhood, and they all remembered me, and they all respected me, and they remember me whipping this guy's ass, and remember me trying to fight this guy. And so they all just had this like natural respect for me and love for me because they remember me being this crazy ass kid that was crazier than all of them. And <clears throat> so that was um, that was that was enlightening to me to to kind of go back to my roots because I had been I'd been living in um, Arizona for a, a while at that point. I'd gone back and forth, but from fifth grade, from 10 years old, 10 years old, 11 years old, 12 years old, I'd been living in Arizona in Sedona, um, you know, in this kind of nice upper middle class area, far removed from the city. And um, kind of going back and like establishing my roots and seeing, you know, just seeing kind of where I came from, it gave me perspective. And this was probably, I was 12 years old in 1990. So this is like, I was just start really getting into rap music and stuff like that. Although actually 1986, I was listening. The first thing I ever, first rap music I ever listened to was Beastie Boys License Ill. I think I actually owned the tape when I was eight years old, 1986. So <clears throat> I was, I just start. I, I was exposed I, to hip hop just a little bit. I was really into Beastie Boys by about um, 12 years old. I started getting into NWA, Too Short. I started, um, I started, you know, really getting into rap music. So, and then as as I as as I spent some time in Milwaukee, and st I started getting schooled by these guys and <clears throat> basically the G code, and started learning gang politics. So where I'm going with this is, I started learning about gang politics, how it's organized, why it works the way that it works, and I'll tell you a little bit about what I was taught. So, I was basically taught that this thing called the struggle. So like. The G code is basically a code of conduct for people who are living in the struggle. And it's basically this idea that like there's this oppressive force in the universe everywhere lurking around every corner trying to oppress you, trying to push you down, trying to make your life hard. And the G code is essentially a, a way that people who live in that life, live in the struggle, work to abide by their own rules and laws to not get um, taken over or destroyed by the struggle, to come, to rise up out of the struggle. So, and you know, the, and the main thing is basically not snitching. Um, it's basically, you don't do hard drugs. You don't, you know, you don't do cocaine. You don't do meth. You don't do heroin. You can sell those drugs to make money and get out the struggle, but you can't do them yourself because that'll pull you down and, and <clears throat> push you deeper into the struggle yourself. So it was essentially, um, you know, a list of things that you can't do, things that you don't do, and then things you should do. So you should hustle, you should make money, you should do what you can to rise up and come up out of the struggle. And and basically you don't snitch and basically don't be a bitch. Like if, you know, somebody, somebody wants, somebody talks shit to you or somebody tries to humiliate you or check you, you basically got to defend yourself. You can't let people walk all over you. So that's it in a nutshell for, you know, any, anybody to basically understand what is the G code and, and what was I learning at about age 12. So then I come back to Arizona and there's none of this going on. I'm just living in like a kind of nice, secluded, upper middle class, white, actually probably just middle middle class, maybe not even upper, but there's a touch of upper. And um, I just start having this understanding of gang politics. And interestingly, though, you got to keep in mind, Arizona is um, on the border and and there is a lot of drugs flowing through here and a lot of uh, Mexican gangs and stuff like that. 
even when you get outside of the cities and have, um, I mean, we, I mean, compared to like the East Coast, there's really not that many African Americans per capita in Arizona as there is in a lot of East Coast cities like Baltimore or something like that. I mean, we have a lot more, <clears throat> I mean, even in the prisons. I mean, it's just known. There's way more whites, way more Mexicans in the prisons. Um, and so really my first exposure to gang banging and gang politics actually happened with the Mexicans. So, and I, I love, I mean, I'm just going to preface it right now. Like I actually love Mexico more than any other country in the world other than the United States. I love Mexican culture. I love, you know, I can't say I love all Mexican people. Everyone's different. I, it's a case by case basis, but as a whole, as a culture, I mean, I generally love almost every, uh, everyone who comes from Mexican culture. And, um, I, I eat Mexican food basically every, almost every single day of my life. Uh, my favorite food is tacos. So <clears throat> this isn't, it, I, it's not that, it's not that we hated Mexicans or had beef with Mexicans because they were Mexican. It's that the Mexicans had all kinds of different gangs. And one of the gangs was Brown Pride. And Brown Pride didn't really like us. So I started getting involved in having uh, a gangster attitude and a gangster lifestyle because I was coming up against basically this thick um, Mexican gangbanging culture I started being exposed to in high school. And... I had actually been warned that gang culture was going <clears> to <throat> sweep across, you know, Arizona and reach the area that I lived in, the Verde Valley, by the time I got to high school. And it, it is exactly what happened. By the time I got to high school, it's, <clears throat> you know, rap music and gang politics and, you know, this gangster life was just like on its way to becoming mainstream. And at the time... um it was basically a lot of Mexican gangs that we were, you know, interacting with up against. Now, in all honesty, I actually believe that a lot of these, I believe that 95% of these people were completely fake. They were not real. They weren't even real gangsters. They were just all a bunch of wannabe gangsters running around with <clears throat> brown rags, trying to claim brown pride, trying to pick on people, bully people. And here's the thing, here's the kicker, here's what got us, was that they wouldn't let there be a one-on-one -on -one fight. Probably the biggest reason that I got involved in gangbanging and kind of started going to the next level was because there was just a an attitude and a culture uh, uh, in this particular gang, Brown Pride. Which, by the way, I have nothing against Brown Pride today. I, I, I you know, I whatever everybody's doing, I respect what everybody's doing. So this isn't a diss on Brown Pride, but this is just what happened when I was a teenager, <clears throat> and. Because they would just roll around and beat up a bunch of innocent, middle-class white kids who don't even know anything about this culture, who don't want to fight anybody, who don't want to have anything to do with anything. They just want to go to school, do their thing, play sports, go to college. They didn't want to be associated with this at all. But there was this mentality that was spreading, and people were getting jumped. People were getting beat up. People were getting bullied. And I didn't like it, and I felt a responsibility. I felt like I understood gang politics and, like, knew these people were fake and they weren't real. And, like, this isn't cool. Like, I'm not going to sit here and watch all these, like, innocent, you know, middle-class white kids who don't know anything about this kind of life just get beat up and bullied for no reason. They're not even doing anything and they don't even want to have a problem. And, you know, it was just kind of like nobody even knew how to deal with it. They didn't even have uh, policies regarding gangs and people being gang affiliated they didn't have policies with the police departments they didn't have policies with the heist with the school system nobody even knew what it was <clears throat> but it was but it was like it was operating in full swing but institutions hadn't even caught on to it yet so this was kind of like the heyday so anyway i knew i understood gangster disciples i started I started, you know, just slowly being gang affiliated, wearing blue, kind of representing like, hey, I'm from Milwaukee. I'm gang affiliated. I'm not actually a gangster, but, you know, I, I'm associated with people that, that are gang affiliated. And, you know, I'm being taught the G-code and 
trying to understand gang politics. But what ends up happening is um, after I had been told about my godfather, so I'd been living in this pressure cooker of all this going on, and then I'd been told this about my my godfather. Um, And so I kind of just... I just took it to the next level. I just, I had so much pointing me in this direction that I just went to the next level and realized like, basically I'm a fucking gangster. I mean, that's, I just came to that epiphany. Like, Hey, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a gangster. I was made for this. I was born into this. I was, I've been around this. And even though I'm living in like a middle-class white area, that's kind of removed from this, I'm also running up against it. Even in this area, like where we go to high school, there's that there's this kind of energy is going on and it's and it's spreading worldwide like worldwide really it's like becoming this like culture that's taking over everything and so what ends up happening is i had a rough childhood i didn't want to live in wisconsin um i didn't want to i didn't want to be under parental control i wanted to be free and i basically started trying to figure out a way to emancipate myself get out from under my parents I started selling drugs, um, trying to figure out a way to like stand on my own two feet and, and, and get out from under my parents, basically. And so I initially, where the story's going is I eventually get uh, initiated into Southside Crips in Phoenix, which is a black gang. And how that ends up happening is I'm basically looking for drug connections to make money and I'm knowing that like yeah I gotta go to the city two hours away I gotta go to Phoenix I gotta go to the hood and I gotta find some gangster ass people who sell drugs that's how I'm gonna get the best price and get you know the best drugs so I initially was literally only trying to make money but I was also very annoyed with what was happening in our high school and how kids were getting beat up and they weren't even wanting to be involved in any of this stuff. They didn't even know how, they didn't understand how any of it worked. They didn't understand gang politics. So through some serendipitous events, a friend of mine just happened to be dating some girl who lived in South Phoenix. She actually initially went to our high school, but then she moved to go live with her grandparents or something like that and ended up in South Phoenix. So my friend was going to see his girlfriend all the time in South Phoenix, <clears throat> and I'd go with him. And then we ended up meeting her neighbor. There's a guy living a couple doors down, this Mexican guy. <clears throat> and, um, I mean, we knew he, I mean, this is in South Phoenix in the hood, and this, this little Mexican guy all tatted up um, was a couple doors down. And we basically knew that, like, hey, this guy's got to be able to get us some weed or something, so... So anyway, we, we like started a conversation with this guy. He was already friendly with, with uh, my friend's girlfriend and her sister and these people. So we became friends with this guy. Um, his name, hope this isn't, uh, <laughs> hope this isn't incriminating or a violation of anything. But like I said, I, I'm trying to speak to some people to people who are real, who who are gangbangers, who are part of hip hop culture. This is the truth. This is what happened. I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you exactly my credentials, what neighborhood I was in, people I hung out with, what I was doing. You can check me on that. You can do your own homework. His name was He was 42 years old. He just got out of prison after a double homicide, killing two people when he was 17. He did a life sentence. And he was in the Mexican Mafia, and he was a Southside Crip. Now, that said, this is probably 1995, Oh, and the neighborhood we were in was um, just off the intersection of 19th Ave and Rozier. So anyone from Arizona who hears this, uh, it was 1995 probably. 19th Ave and Rozier was the intersection. And we were probably on maybe like 18th Ave or something like that, a little side street. And his name is... Actually, I don't know. I hope that. I actually don't know for sure as long as I ever looked at his ID, but that's what he told me his name was. And uh, his name in the hood was <laughs> So anyone who's from this area, from this neighborhood, um, this is the guy I'm basically telling you I was involved with and, and who I worked with and basically who, who swore me into Southside Crips. Um, <laughs> he basically... He ba- so he just got out of prison. He's a Mex- little Mexican guy. 
He's in the Mexican mafia, and he happens to be a Southside Crip. Now, how is he a Southside Crip if he's Mexican? Okay, that's the first logical question anybody should be asking. He, the only reason he was able to be a Southside Crip is because he's from a Southside Crip neighborhood, but just happens to be Mexican. So as anyone who comes from this culture understands, we, especially in Arizona, when you're in Arizona and you go to prison, you go with your race. So when he's in prison, he's not a Crip. He's a Mexican mafia. He's a Mexican. He has to run with Mexicans. But he was from a Crip neighborhood, so he was allowed to be both because there was a truce in the prison systems throughout California and Arizona, maybe other states too, I don't know, but definitely California and Arizona. There was a truce in the south between the Mexican mafia and the Crips, and that alliance was called the Sereños which means Southerners, and they were at war with the Norteños, which was the Northerners. And the Sereños wore blue. Basically, it was the Mexican Mafia, and the Crips were allies, and they wore blue. And they were against the Norteños, who wore red, and they were from the north. So the reason he was allowed to be a Crip on the street was because of the truce. Now, if the truce uh, went away, he had to go back to being with Mexicans and just being Mexican Mafia, but he was allowed to be both. So it's a very bizarre story. It's totally the truth. Anyone who's from these neighborhoods, who's from Phoenix, who wants to check it out, I mean, I'm telling the truth. So I got nothing to hide. I got nothing to lie about. So, you know, go do your own homework and see if what I'm saying is true. Um, so he gets out on a double, after serving a life sentence on a double homicide. 42 years old, and what he told me at the time was that basically he gets, uh, like basically they get put on for two years, and then they're off for two years, and then they're on for two years, and they're off for something like that. So basically, he comes out of prison, and right off the bat, it, he, he's on. It's, it's game time. He's supposed, to, he's supposed to hustle, make money, do his thing for at least two years or something like that. I, that doesn't even make sense to me now that I'm older, but I was 17 years old. That's what he told me. I don't know if that's how it works or not, but that's what he told me. So he's basically in grind mode. He's doing everything he can to make money, and he's trying to come up quick, and he, he basically has um, access to a lot of things because he's Mexican Mafia, and he's connected. And, and um, so unfortunately for me, um, this... I, I wish that this didn't happen, but it turns out there was a lot of crack. Uh, I mean, obviously there's a lot of crack today, but there was a lot of crack dealing going on at that time. And so his first job he got out of prison in the, in, I mean, in the hood, in the streets, was basically being paid to guard crack houses. So he, he'd be hired for a specific period of time. Like, okay, Wednesday from you know, 4 p.m. to 2 a.m., I'm going to be guarding this crack house on such and such a street. And, you know, it, and, and that's basically what he's getting paid to do. <clears throat> what he did is he hired me and a friend of mine to guard him. So before I even got initiated, this is, this is how our relationship started. So I was just trying to get a connection. I was just trying to get a hookup to sell drugs. I was a crazy-ass person. I had, you know, I, I already just kind of had a lot of this in me. So we start basically getting paid to go with him to go to a crack house and basically stand there and protect him. So it would work like this. There'd basically be a crack house. You open the door, you walk, you walk straight in. He's sitting in a chair. He's got like, he's got a fully automatic, um, Tech nine in his lap and a scarf over it. And then he's got basically, he's either already got the crack on him or he's got people in a back room ready to bring it to the front. And me and a friend of mine, we're each standing, we're basically standing in each corner on each side of him, also with weapons to, and basically told, um, you know, people are going to come in, they're going to pay, they're going to do this. If anybody does anything crazy, just basically shoot, like no questions asked, like shit pops off, somebody starts getting crazy, somebody starts like, 
you know, trying to rob us or do something stupid, basically you just shoot. And there's no talking. You just start shooting. So, um, I know that probably sounds horrible to <laughs> normal people or, I don't know, I'm sure all kinds of people that doesn't sound very good. But that's, you know, this is the life I was living. I don't know why I was living it. I don't know. I don't know how I got this deep right off the bat, but I was basically in South Phoenix in these neighborhoods. Here's another thing you can check that at the time I was doing this, there were three neighborhoods in the United States that police wouldn't go into. One was in D.C., one was in Chicago, one was in Phoenix. The neighborhood I was doing this in was that neighborhood. It was the neighborhood in Phoenix that police wouldn't even go into. So it was a very dangerous neighborhood. Um, this is in the height of, like, gang warfare, and there was just literally drive-bys every single day. Just, I mean, it was, it was a war zone. It was like Iraq or Afghanistan. Just they come shoot our houses up and... We go in their neighborhoods and their houses get shot up. And it was just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And pretty much, I mean, straight out, <laughs> as crazy as you can possibly imagine. Straight out of a movie. Uh, straight out of, I mean, basically I can't imagine, you know, Compton being any worse than what was happening. I mean, it was as bad as you can possibly imagine. People getting killed every single day on the same streets, you know, just back and forth, like, like, like you're actually in a war zone. <clears throat> and none of this was even being reported on the news. It's like nobody even cared. People just be getting killed left and right. Bodies would be, you know, dumped in places and people would just disappear. I mean, it was just as crazy as anybody could ever possibly imagine. So anyway, I get like pretty deep in this culture and I start trying to sell a little bit of uh, drugs here and there. I'm doing my thing. And, um, eventually he asks, I don't, I'm not even sure how it exactly happened. I just know that I eventually got initiated into Southside Crips and I'm not even going to tell that story. Um, it's a pretty intense story, but basically I had to, um, I mean, in all, I actually, I take that back. I mean, in all honesty, I actually didn't have to do some things I thought I had to do, but I had to be willing to do some really crazy stuff. And um, once they saw I was for real and believed that I was all in and I was going to do what I said I was going to do, I eventually got, um, through some luck and good fortune and things working out, <laughs> Uh, the best they basically could. I eventually got sworn in and was told, um, almost like we were, I, I think looking back, it's almost like we were like honorary members where it was essentially like, hey, you're white boys. We can't really, you know, there's, it's, you can kind of be in the gang officially, technically, and we can have your back, but that's only in the streets. You go to prison, you're white. You, you know, there's nothing, in fact, it'll probably get you hurt you know, being gang affili affiliated with with a black gang, I mean, you, it's not going to go over well with Aryan Brotherhood, and that's basically the jurisdiction you're going to be under. So, <clears throat> um, long story short, I mean, I basically was in that environment, 1995 to 1996. Um, I got sworn in. I, I actually was a Southside Crip. I was only hanging out with OGs. I was not, I was not, just like out on the block, hanging out with a bunch of kids, drinking 40s, getting in fist fights. That's not what I was doing. I was guarding OGs who were dealing with OGs in L.A., and they were doing some serious gangster shit, basically. And I don't know how I immediately... In fact, to be completely honest with you, <clears throat> I guess I'll, t I'll tell you this, too. Like, uh, you know, not, I'm not proud of this at all, but I, I just I feel... Like, I kind of want to vet myself a little bit and just be honest to the Arizona hip-hop community, at least. People that people that know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> Basically, I was told that there's all these different levels you can get initiated. You can have these youngsters, like, jump you in. Or you can have, you know, like, we were only 17 years old. Like, you'll, you can have 17-year-olds jump you in, and then this will be your rank. Or you can have, like, 25-year-olds jump you in, and this will be your rank. Or you can have, you know, these people initiate you, and this will be your rank. Or... You can have OGs initiate you, and this will be your rank. Or you can have the head of all Southside Crips initiate you, and this will be your rank. And so 
crazy as it sounds, um, I picked the highest initiation there was, and I was just all in from the get-go. I just said, okay, go ahead and give me the initiation from the head of all Southside Crips. So the honest truth is, and I never, in all honesty, I never even met the guy, but I was told, like, basically this went, uh, you know, the guy I was hanging out with, he took it straight to the head of Southside Crips out of L.A. Said, hey, we got these crazy white boys been working with me. They've been protecting me. I've been, you know, running these crack houses, and they've been my right-hand men. And they want to get sworn in, and they want you to do the initiation. Uh, so, you know, give them an initiation that's, the ch- you know, that tests them. So the honest truth is I was basically told our initiation came directly from the head of all Southside Crips. It was super intense and crazy. He wanted to see if we had the courage to show up. I had the courage. I showed up. He basically told, uh, hey, uh, if these crazy white boys have the balls to show up to, to that, uh, don't make them do it. Just just swear them in and, and give them a pass. Because obviously if they're crazy enough to show up, they obviously got heart. They're obviously worthy of, of, of being in. So the honest truth... Um, yeah, honestly, I'm kind of embarrassed and ashamed in a lot of ways of like a lot of stuff I did and stuff I've been through, but I'm just, I'm trying really hard to be as honest as I can. And I, and I want to, I want to speak to everybody. I really want to speak to gang bangers and people that live in this life, but I also want just the average people to be able to kind of be on the sideline and sit and listen and watch me talk about this and then actually interact with people that are from this culture. That's kind of where I'm going with this podcast and what I want to be doing. And, um, it's really hard to explain all this to people and, you know, tell the story. It's, it's super intense. There's tons of things I'm probably not ever, ever, ever going to be able to say. Um, I hope someday I can, maybe when I'm a lot older, but for now, I'm just trying to lay a basic foundation and help people understand that, um, yeah, I was, (laughs) so by the time I was 17, I'll recap real quick. I, I, had, I had kind of been schooled by, I'd been schooled about the G code by gangster disciples out of Milwaukee. I've been told my godfather was the head of the, of the mafia out of Milwaukee. I was born straight into the largest bust in U.S. history. That is the story that the movie Casino is about. <clears throat> and then I was initiated into Southside Crips by the head of all of Southside Crips out of Los Angeles. That's the honest truth of like who I was and what I was doing by the time I was age 17. Now, I come back to my high school and, you know, I'm not even going to, I can't even get into the who, what, and where, but basically there's a certain group of people who had been um, creating a lot of uh, tension and beef and... I mean, I guess I'm going to go ahead and say exactly kind of what happened. It's um, it's a little bit intense. But basically, I was beefing. I mean, I wasn't directly beefing. I just wasn't liking what a lot of these people were doing. Basically, this large group of Mexicans claiming brown pride. I'm convinced 95% of them are fake. They're not even real. <clears throat> the people at the top of this gang, though, the, the, the leaders, the one everyone feared, they all claimed to be families that were connected to the Mexican mafia. Everyone was like, oh, yeah, you don't want to mess with them. Those guys are Mexican Mafia. That guy's Mexican Mafia. That guy's Mexican Mafia. You're always hearing, he's Mexican Mafia. He's Mexican Mafia. He's Mexican Mafia. The whole family's Mexican Mafia. <clears throat> so one of the reasons that, like, these Brown Pride guys, even though, like, most of the guys claim Brown Pride, they weren't even, like, they weren't even that real. They just they just felt safety in numbers, <clears throat> and as long as they were rolling around 30 deep, jumping one guy at a time, they thought they were tough. And, you know, I didn't think there was anything cool about that. I didn't like that at all. But the reason that they were able to get away with it was because the guys running their gang were supposedly actually were Mexican mafia and they actually were real and their their families, their brothers, their uncles, their you know, their dads were multi generational, you know, Mexican mafia. So <clears throat> for that reason, you know, there was a level of realness going on, but like so much of it was was not real. And um so, 
this is intense to say all this. I'm having a hard time getting it out, but I basically was sick and tired of seeing these people getting picked on. So I asked, I asked permission. Here's where the, here's where the politics comes in. This is, I had a friend who started to explain this to me. He's like, you know, one of the, one of the reasons you understand so much about politics in general and like the reason you're so passionate about politics is because you got your understanding from politics from gang politics. And really there's not much difference between gang politics and actual politics. And, um, and as Jesse Ventura pointed out in the Democrats and the Bloodikins book, um, you know, Democrats and Republicans are basically like two big gangs. And, um, Anyway, that was a little bit of a tangent, but I basically got permission from Southside Crips, from the Mexican Mafia, to go to these people who were doing this, to find the leader, and to start a war. So basically, um, Southside Crips said, okay, you know, you're in, you're working with our, our leaders, and you basically got a bunch of fake wannabe brown pride guys running around, bullying, picking out a bunch of people. Um, you've earned your stripes. If you want to, like, check them and take them to war, you know, give them an ultimatum. You know, either stop doing what you're doing or we're going to take you to war. Um, you got the green light. So they basically gave us the green light. They gave us the authority and the green light. Now, that said, he said basically Southside Crips gives you permission to initiate a war with, with this chapter of Brown Pride, because obviously it's not the whole gang, it's just this chapter, this set that's up in this area that you're, you're like hanging out in. <clears throat> um, you have the authority to go start a war. Um, and in addition to that, the Mexican Mafia will not allow... He got something cleared up that said... Even if this guy is connected to the Mexican Mafia, we will the Mexican Mafia will protect you and won't allow his people to touch you, essentially. So I essentially got an immunity or, order from the Mexican Mafia, and I got the authority to start a war between the Southside Crips and this specific chapter of Brown Pride, who I didn't honestly didn't really even think was that real. I still kind of think it was mostly a bunch of wannabes who weren't that real. But... I didn't really know, so I just went ahead and, you know, okay, maybe you guys are real. I'm going to treat you like you're real. There's 30 of you with brown rags running around beating people up, claiming brown pride. I'm just going to assume you're brown pride. So I got the permission, went to the leader, um, <laughs> basically caught him slipping somewhere one day and pulled up on him, put a bunch of guns in his face. We were covered in blue bandanas head to toe screaming at the top of our lungs and just basically let them know like the south side crips like basically you're being checked you need to stop being like a fake bitch running around trying to jump people 30 on one and all the shit you're doing and i don't give i basically i don't care if you're mexican mafia or not i basically got a protection order from the mexican mafia you can't touch me here's some names of some people if you think that you if you think you're connected and you've got all this power, you know, go ahead and check what I just told you. Like, these people say I'm protected. You can't touch me. And as far as this brown pride shit you're doing, you know, this is a message straight from Southside Crips in South Phoenix. If you, you know, want to keep being disrespectful and doing what you're doing, we're ready to take you to war. Otherwise, quit doing what you're doing and, and we'll leave you alone, basically. And um, I didn't say any of it that nice. <laughs> I was super heated and... We had a bunch of guns pointed at him, and it's, you know, people could have easily gotten killed. Thank God they didn't. Um, so after that, you know, it basically kind of stopped. It kind of got better, um, but not entirely. I mean, a long story short is that was just the beginning, and um, the further we got on the rabbit hole here, I'm not really sure how I'm going to end this podcast or where I'm going to take this whole journey, but I wanted to take listeners on a ride to sort of know some of the life that I've been through, the things that I did, how I got to where I am, um, 
quite honestly and frankly, as embarrassed as I am to say this, because I don't really take much pride in this, but it, it is my credentials. It's like basically I do have a lot of street credit. I do have a lot of credentials. I have lived this life at the highest level any human being could ever possibly live this. I would welcome the realest people on the face of this earth. I don't care if you're the head of, I don't care if you're Larry Hoover, I don't care if you're Pablo Escobar, I don't care if you're the head of a gang, a cartel, I don't care who you are, I respect you, I hope you're able to respect me, I really have lived this life, although I am a bit of a paradox, because I also lived lived a whole other life, I'm also very spiritually minded, I also grew up in Sedona, Arizona, I also have a grandmother who was a minister of a unity church, who taught me a lot of spiritual principles. I deeply care about people in the world and and um, I've been through a lot and there's a lot of dimension. So I'm trying to lay the foundation though about just all the gang affiliated stuff that I've been through and what I've done. So to keep going, to tell the rest of the story. Um, I, I come out the other end of all this. I eventually end up moving to um, Phoenix after this, after I graduate high school. I go to ASU for a year. And, you know, interestingly in that time, I actually, I did link up with um, some gangster disciples from Chicago some some young guys there were only they were only like they were my, they were my age so they were basically like 18 years old and um but they'd come out to Phoenix from Chicago and their dad I believe was some high ranking gangster disciple or something and they were sent on a mission to spread gangster disciples to the west coast and told to they created a gang called Gangster Team Family and they were basically trying to recruit Bloods and Crips to join their gang, Gangs Team Family. And I believe they wore blue and red. I, I don't I highly doubt I don't I doubt that this gang still exists because I haven't heard of it in a very long time. But um anyway, I was living in Phoenix for a year, went to ASU. I, I was trying to be somewhat balanced and keep my education going and not um be too deep in some of this stuff. But I was affiliated with these kind of people. I hung out with these people. I knew these people. But I also, you know, kind of almost lived a double, not really lived a double life because I had integrity. Everybody knew who I was in, in both worlds, but I just walked between two worlds. Um, and then, I guess this is, this is kind of an interesting side plot. Um, it's not really relevant, but it, it, it's just a bizarre, it's a bizarre twist that my, story takes, um, still kind of is bizarre and interesting to me. So I ended up dating this girl. Um, I started dating her at 18. I actually started, it was almost like the first week I started ASU. Um, I started dating this girl from Sedona. And, uh, so the whole year that I was in Phoenix going to ASU, I was with her. And then I believe I moved to Sedona for one more year after that while I was with her. Then we moved to Tucson, where I lived with her for a year. So that was our third year. And then she moved to LA. Um, actually, no, she only lived in Tucson, I think, half that year. And then she moved to LA. So we did like two and a half years together in Arizona, and then two and a half years of her living in LA and me living in Tucson, or me living in Arizona. And um, anyway, so how, how my plot thickens in my story is... Um, you know, I was just kind of like a, basically like a low level gangbanger, like hustler, but also like going to school, you know, trying to like still have a future. Um, and stating this girl, she was actually an actress where the story's going is she becomes an actress, she eventually becomes an actress in Hollywood and she ends up leaving me for, after we were together for five years, ends up leaving me for, um, this guy Aaron Paul, who's the main character in Breaking Bad, I think his name—I think his character name is Jesse. I never even watched the show, so I don't know. But um, anyway, that was a very bizarre 
uh, twist in my story in my life. Um, but in any case, I ended up, uh, the reason I ended up in Tucson is simply because I was with her and she was an actress. She was two years younger than me. So she was, she had to do her junior year and her senior year in high school the whole, while we were together. So I was with her the, both those two years. And then we both moved to Tucson so she could go to U of A, um, and be in their theater program. But she ended up doing such a, an amazing job, uh, in theater. She ended up, usually you don't get to actually, um, have like a leading role in a play or something like that until, uh, you're a junior or senior or something like that. And somehow she got lucky and got like a lead role her freshman year, knocked it out of the park. Everyone was blown away by her performance. And she just kind of quickly thought, you know, what am I doing? Like this in like a theater in like a college when I could just go straight to Hollywood. So anyway, she basically drops out of college and goes straight to LA and ends up going to Hollywood, gets super lucky, gets a speaking role on party of five, which was a big show back then, uh, like right out of the gates and then just started kind of taking off and just getting more and more speaking roles. Um, and anyway, so that's how I end up in Tucson now that I'm in Tucson. So I've already kind of told you my background. Um, it started out with, uh, being exposed to gangster disciples and the G code. I end up getting initiated into Southside Crips. I'm hanging out with a guy who's Mexican mafia. My godfather is actually the head of the, the, the mafia in Milwaukee. And, um, <laughs> and, and I also alluded to this idea that there was a truce between, the, um, the Crips and the Mexican mafia. And, uh, and the, the name of that alliance was the Sereños. So when I was living in Tucson, I just coincidentally linked up with some Mexicans in South Tucson. Not So this isn't Phoenix anymore. This is now Tucson. So in South Tucson, I end up linking up with Southside Sereños, which is basically these Mexican, crazy, crazy, crazy Mexican gangbangers that all wear blue. Um, and <laughs> um, yeah, I, I went down the rabbit hole with these guys. And these guys were... I, I, I'm real quick going to just kind of speak on a culture difference about what I learned uh, living the street. I, I, I guess what I'm about to say right now, this kind of speaks to all people, uh, maybe in the whole world, but definitely in the, in the United States who live like a street life or, you know, gangbang or hustle or, you know, think whatever, think they're, they're real or doing some stuff in the streets and think that they have street credit or whatever, whatever it is that, um, the way that it works in Phoenix versus the way that it works in Tucson, in my experience, is, I, I don't remember if somebody pointed this out to me or if I came to this conclusion on my own. It was, it feels like everyone in Phoenix wants to be the man, like wants you to think they're the man. They want to brag and show off and pretend like they're this huge boss and they're doing all this stuff. And everyone in Tucson actually is the man. And they don't want you to know anything. And so I went through a learning curve in hood culture, street life, thinking you're real, thinking you're hard, thinking you know what's up, thinking that you're, you know, basically real. And I was, I used to be in like this petty street mindset of like kill or be killed and fight and represent and wear certain colors and, you know, just just basically be wild and, and, and everyone's all bragging and trying to show off and prove to everybody that they're, you know, the realest person out there. When I moved to Tucson at 19 years old, I feel like I went to the next level. It's sort of like going from junior high to high school or going from high school to college or going from college to grad school or law school or medical school. It, it, it was the next level. Um, I thought people were real and doing a bunch of crazy stuff in Phoenix, which they are. Believe me, Phoenix is a major uh, warehouse for drugs across the whole country. But Tucson is just like at the next level on a per capita basis. The amount of drug trafficking and realness that's happening in Tucson versus Phoenix is you know, tenfold at least. 
When you're living in that life in Tucson, these people are really, really, really doing it. I mean, and they really don't want you to know. <laughs> and like they really don't want you to know. They are not trying to show off. They're not trying to drive fancy cars. They're not trying to show you how much money they have. They don't want you to know anything. They want you to think that they're a plumber. And when they're driving around in their plumber van, that whole thing might be loaded with bales of weed and kilos of cocaine. You have no idea who's who or what's what. And um, anyway, I'm going on a little tangent, but that that's the learning curve that I went through. And that's when I realized, like, oh, my God, the people who are really doing this, like, people who are really moving, like, 2,000 pounds of weed or more are not running around trying to brag about it. Like, <laughs> they're paranoid about how much they have to lose. They have so much to lose. They're doing everything they can to cover it up and, you know, make you think that they're nobody and they've got nothing going on. And, I mean, in fact, that happens long before that. That happens at... 100 pounds. I mean, once you get to about 100 pounds, anyone moving 100 pounds or more is usually not trying to brag, not trying to show off, not trying to have anyone know what they're doing. And, you know, of course, every now and then there's a really sloppy person who's doing that, but nine, 99 out of 100 times, those people aren't doing nothing. And... um I guess I got another little random story. Um, real quick, a lot of people might not know this, but the, the drug corridor between uh, Tucson and El Paso, which is essentially where I was and what I'm about to get into, uh, this is the, the corridor that um, the Sinaloan cartel run by El Chapo basically trafficked some estimates and upwards of about 80% of all the drugs in the United States. So... It, during different time periods. So during the time period that I was there, this was uh, the height of this being the main drug corridor for... I, I don't know. I don't know if this is true. Again, I, I'm not, it's not like I'm out here verifying all these facts, but from what I've heard, it was about 80% of all the drugs in the country were coming through this corridor. So as you can imagine, that's... The, that's this is the... This is the culture that I got my PhD in. So, you know, I understand and I respect, you know, let's, let's say from a hip hop level, you look at people like Mob Deep, Nas, Jay-Z, you look at like the Kings of New York. And it's like, okay, you guys come from a certain culture. You come from like a real grimy city in the projects in New York, the big, you know, the Big Apple, which is mixed with big, 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 big international money. Um, and huge, you know, industry, uh, fashion industry and finance and, you know, huge industries um, in the global economy. You got people in L.A. You got The Game and Dr. Dre and, like, N.W.A., Ice Cube. You got this culture out of L.A. that's, you know, got the influence of Compton and gangs, Bloods and Crips and um, Hollywood and uh, the television, music, movies, you know, you got this whole culture influencing things. And, um, you know, you got Chicago, um, you know, with the, like probably the highest murder capital in the country at this point and their culture. And there's a culture that I have hardly ever seen or heard anyone ever talk about. Barely any movies have come out about it. Uh, maybe the movie Traffic. But there's an entire world, um, you know, the movie Blow, the movie Traffic. There's whole worlds of gang culture and politics and street people coming out of, you know, these drug corridors, Tucson, El Paso, where, you know, it's basically no joke. I mean, they're supplying the entire United States with drugs. And um, it's just a whole nother level. And our culture... And this is basically what we're from and hopefully what we will represent in hip-hop if we um, can get the Arizona hip-hop community off the ground and really get on a platform. I'm not sure if, if our the time... I'm not sure... Um, 
if there's still a window of opportunity for all of this to even be relevant or if there isn't. But um, I do know this is what makes us unique. This is what makes us different from L.A., from Chicago, from Miami, from Houston, from New York. I mean, it's like we have we have something to offer. We have a culture. In fact, I was at a um, a no limit. Um, what was it? It's basically a seminar with Master P and No Limit, and um, they were basically trying to you know teach their strategy and and how to make it in the industry and. I remember telling uh, the head A and R, this guy Jay Tweezy, I said, um, I "said you know the reason that nobody's ever made it from Arizona is not because um, there's no talent, there's no rappers or whatever. It's because the people who are real here, number one, don't need rap money. Like we're already getting money, and we don't. Uh, we have a culture where." The culture here is, is is the highest level drug trafficking that you can possibly imagine, you know, on the face of the earth. And and the realest people in this have nothing to prove, have nothing to show off, don't want anyone to know what they're doing, and they're making more money than you can imagine. They got they got they got no incentive. There's no reason to go out and brag and try to show off and tell people what they're doing. They don't want to tell anybody what they're doing. So we have, our culture is, is inhibits people from having that hunger and getting out there and making it. And, th- and that's, I think, one of the reasons we don't have, especially like a, like a hardcore, you know, like a Master P or like a, uh, I don't know, who else? I'm trying to think of a big name out of um, like a Lil Wayne or something like that. You know, it's like we reason we don't have like some big A-list person who came out of our culture, out of our city is because there is, there is not enough incentive. There's not enough reason. Like we, if you're real and you're living that life, you're going to go down a different path. You're going to become a major drug trafficker. That's what you're going to do. You're not going to become a rapper. That's not to say that there isn't rappers who are real. I'm just saying, uh, on a statistical basis, the number of people that are going to go one direction or the other. You know, if you're hungry and you're living in, uh, you know, a drug destination city like Chicago, um, you're just living in a different culture. It's it's a street life culture that's unique to that city, to that area. So it's going to produce a certain type of music, a certain type of culture that supports that. And the only thing that's ever going to make a lot of, or that would have made a lot of sense to me in the 90s and uh, early 2000s would have been, you know, a culture and a sound that emulates this culture, that, you know, that is our culture. Um, anyway, I... Um, let me wrap this up and bring this full circle. So I end up uh, hanging out with Southside Sereños in South Tucson and basically go down the rabbit hole, end up hanging out with... I mean, here, here here's what it is in a nutshell. I mean, if you go far enough down the rabbit hole, living in Tucson, starting out hanging out with the Sereños, but just going all the way down the rabbit hole, you're va- eventually just basically going to be interacting with cartels. I mean, it's just, that's it. You're, I mean, and then people that aren't even affiliated with a cartel. They're just drug trafficking, period. Whether you're independent or, or you're part of some organization, it doesn't matter. Like, nobody even really cares. It's like, do you got money? Are you real? Can you be trusted? And are you moving weight? That's all that matters. It doesn't matter for anything else. And um, so... I ended up living in Tucson for five years. So in that five years, I um, I got to know how that culture worked. I mean, I guess that's all I'm going to say. So um, the total summary, um, in a nutshell, um, 
and this is primarily for people who come from this culture. I'm trying to speak to you to understand what these credentials are, what my what the street credit is, you know, where I'm coming from, what I've done, how I got to where I am. And maybe a lot of that's pretty irrelevant to everybody else, but I just felt that I needed to put this out there so that people who do want to talk to us, work with us, come on our podcast, um, do something positive for the world. I mean, a lot of the stuff I'm saying, it all sounds maybe, I mean, at least to me, it sounds a little bit intense and dark and kind of hopeless. Like, where are you going with all this? But the truth is is that this was all just one side of the coin. There's a whole other side of the coin, which is um, the big picture, understanding what the big picture is, what's What's really going on in the world? Why are things the way they are? What are we doing here? How do we make things better? Um, that's really what I want to be doing. That's really what our podcast is going to be about. That's what our, our company is about. But in order for you to want to work with us, especially if you come from this culture, you need to know who we are and what we're about. And um, so in a nutshell, I'm, I'm just going to summarize it one more time, is basically... Born in the largest bust in U.S. history, Godfather uh, was the head of the Italian mafia, um, gang affiliated with gangster disciples, uh, sworn into Southside Crips by the head of all Southside Crips, um, interacting with the Mexican mafia a little bit, but not really. I, I got to say, I didn't. That was the closest I ever came to them, and it was really just one contact. Um, and then. Oh, maybe that's not true. I guess the more I think about it, you definitely run into them sometimes in in the 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 hood culture in Tucson. Um, And then hung out, you know, hung out with Southside Sereños. And, um, but ultimately uh, graduated from all this street level stuff and really got my PhD in understanding um, the drug trafficking culture that runs between Tucson and El Paso, basically. And that's basically it. That, that's, that's who I am and the life I've lived, and, and I did live it to the fullest. And um, like I said, I, I'd be happy to talk to whoever is the realest, most credentialed person anybody's ever heard of or ever known ever. I would be more than happy to meet with them in some kind of safe environment where I could easily prove, you know, who I am and what I'm about and everything I've been through. And basically, I already just said it all. And there's really not much more I have to say than that. But, um, you know, if somebody doubts me and uh, they want to try to call me out on it, I'm happy to to prove it. So... <sighs> I guess that's it. Um, I know that was pretty long-winded. That was really hard for me to to get all that out. But I just wanted to lay that foundation for whoever has the patience and the time to take all that in. And um, stay tuned and check out some of our other podcasts coming up because hopefully um, I, I'll keep expanding on this and I'll give you more insight. All that's just really the tip of the iceberg and kind of a... Uh, foundation and a blueprint for what we're going to be about.